hypothalamic um, pituitary and hypothalamic involvement could result in all kinds of endocrine dysfunction from short stature, diabetes insipidus, precocious puberty, not usually delayed puberty, but theoretically one can see that as well. Um, visual impairment through involvement of the optic chiasm. And then because the third ventricle is right there, it's a critical area, symptoms of increased intracranial pressure if that ventricle is obstructed. So headache, vomiting, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk about two cases and we're gonna come back to these in the end. So you don't have to remember all the details but this is just sort of to whet your appetite. And then once we learn more about different kinds of tumors we'll come back to these cases and see what they were. Um, so, and these are all, every image here is, is a patient of mine. So these are all, you know, real cases, not just Google images. Um, so case one is a four-year-old boy. He had short stature for a long time and for the previous one to two years had had um, decreased growth velocity. So his whole family was actually short. And uh, this kid came to me because his aunt lives across the street from me, believe it or not. So I, I know the family, they're all tiny, but for the previous one to two years, he had started falling off his growth curve. He was diagnosed with celiac disease about a year prior to presentation and the, the decreased um, growth velocity was attributed to the celiac disease. He, However, he had um, testing that showed low growth hormone levels and had an appointment pending with an endocrinologist to follow up and see if maybe it was more than just celiac. Um, the day of presentation, he was playing with his eight-year-old brother and his eight-year-old brother accidentally kicked him in his eye and in his right eye. So the brother freaked out and clearly this eight-year-old brother has the makings of a neurologist because he said, okay, I need to see if you can see cover your right eye. Can you see me? Cover your left eye. Can you see me? And he found that, lo and behold, his brother couldn't see anything out of his left eye. So not the eye that was kicked. His right eye was fine, but when he closed his right eye, he couldn't see anything out of his left eye. So again, this, this um, very on top of it, eight-year-old boy went over to his mother and told him so-and-so can't see out of his left eye. He went to the um, ophthalmologist who found no light perception at all in the left eye, and he was sent directly to the ER for an MRI. This is his um, MRI here. This is a side view on the flare. This is post contrast over here. Oh, sorry, you can see my, this is the side view, the sagittal view on the flare, post contrast, and this is coronal post contrast. And I think even a non-neurologist could see the lesion or a non-radiologist, right? It's this egg shaped thing right here. And notice this very, very wide bony cella, which tells us that this is a bit, this has been a very long standing process. And this is chronic remodeling over, over a long period of time. Um, now, interestingly, you might say, well, how did this kid not notice that he lost vision in one eye? And this is surprisingly uncommon. Um, when I have found that when people come into the ER and say they can't, they've lost, suddenly lost vision on one side, it's more often a field cut and not complete visual loss of one eye because that often goes completely unnoticed for whatever reason. I guess our brains just adapt. Um, this is this child's CT. So you can see these findings here around the edges of the mass. And this, class, this calcification is a pretty classic sign for this kind of tumor. So keep this in mind. Okay, now case two, this was an 18 year old boy who had had complex partial seizures or complex focal seizures with um, impaired awareness or the updated nomenclature is for four years. For the prior two years, he had a history of polydipsia, which again, this was a, you know, a teenage boy. He did not realize that this was not normal. Um, he kept a gallon bottle of water next to his bed at night. And by the morning, he, he woke up multiple times at night to pee and to use and to drink. And by the end of the night in the morning, the gallon jug of water was finished, was empty. So um, he did not realize that there was anything remarkable about this, didn't even think to mention this, his doctor or his mother. Several weeks prior to presentation, he was just kind of feeling generally ill and not himself. Um, went to the pediatrician who found him to be extremely hypotensive, sent some general blood work, and he had hypothyroidism. His electrolytes were normal and no other hormones were checked. Um, so this is, he sent him to the ER and this is his imaging right here. Um, and you can see the, this is the flare. So this is axial, this is 
sagittal. And again, you can see this lesion here in the supracellar region, Intras intracellar slash supracellar. Um, this is post contrast, so this really very avidly enhances. And uh, keep these these cases in mind as we start talking about two of the most common supracellar tumors in childhood. Um, all right, so we're going to start with cranial frangiomas. So these are not common, and I mean, I you know, I guess if you're in neuro oncology, you see them, but in the world in general, they're not common. They're up to four percent of all pediatric brain tumors but they are the most common supracellar tumor that needs treatments. And that's because those rafties, cleft cysts, et cetera, usually don't need anything. They tend to occur in young children or sort of, you know, school age children. So young adolescents or late childhood, ages five to 14, the incidence is equal between males and females. And these are histologically benign. So like so many childhood brain tumors, they are not cancer, meaning they're not malignant. They don't um, metastasized to other parts of the body. But because uh, my former mentor, Dr. Jeff Allen, used to say the tumor is benign, but the location is malignant. So they need treatment just because of where they are um, and the collateral damage they can cause as they grow. Younger children tend to have adam adamantinomatous, bleh, that's a, a tongue twister, subtype of craniopharyngiomas that expresses beta catenin. Older patients more often have the papillary subtype that has this BRAF B600E mutation. Um, and this is a mutation that's actually very common in many kinds of childhood brain tumors, especially gliomas, but papillary craniopharyngiomas also have that. Um, and the reason why this is relevant is because there are now for gliomas at least targeted treatments available to inhibit this, um, this enzyme. They are epithelial tumors, so they arise from the remnants of the Rathke's cleft. We think that children are probably born with them or born at least with that, those remnants of the Rathke's cleft, and then it be, develops into a tumor, which is why we see it in, we tend to see it in younger children. On imaging, there is usually a cystic and solid component. There are often calcifications, which is, is fairly specific to this kind of tumor. Um, and the the fluid inside when they, the tumors are cut open are lipid rich, very viscous, this sort of motor oil you might hear it called. Um, about 94%, so almost all of cranial pharyngiomas involve the hypothalamus at diagnosis. So you can think about what that means in terms of symptoms, um, often these endocrine deficiencies, especially growth, um, growth retardation and hypothyroidism. If the tumor is large enough because of the location, it can obstruct the foramen of Monroe and cause hydrocephalus with all of the symptoms that that entails, headaches, vision changes, vomiting, somnolence, et cetera. And uh, sure enough, headaches, visual impairments are among the more common presenting symptoms. So here's what it looks like. Like I said, you can see the calcifications on CT, and this is a very common presentation of this tumor. On MRI, so you see this, lip, this sort of um, lipid-rich fluid filling the cyst, and there's this solid component components over here in the cellar region itself. Questions about craniopharyngiomas? Okay, so now moving ahead to the second type of tumor I said we're going to discuss, these are the germ cell tumors. So germ cell tumors are about 3% of pediatric brain tumors. Um, they are more common in young adolescents or late childhood, so ages 10 to 12 is when it peaks, but we can see them in older teenagers as well. They are more than twice as common in boys as compared to girls. Um, they tend to be midline, so that includes the supracellar region, but they also occur in the pineal region, and actually the pineal region is more common than the supracellar region. However, in girls, <clears throat> the, excuse me, the supracellar region is more common than pineal. Um, up to about 13% of patients can actually have what's called bifocal tumors. So at the time of diagnosis, they have tumors in the supracellar region and also in the pineal region. There are multiple types of germ, germ cell tumors, um, and this ranges from, well, sort of less malignant to more malignant. So they're straight up germinomas, mixed monomorphic malignant germ cell tumors, and teratomas. And I'll just talk briefly about those in a, in a little bit. The most common presentation is um, diabetes insipidus. So because of the pituitary hypothalamic involvement, um, DI is extremely common and to the 
point where DI is almost pathognomonic for a germ cell tumor. So if DI is present when you see someone with a supercellular mass, germ cell tumor should be at the top of your differential. Um, we actually recently had a patient who her imaging looked very much like a um, optic pathway glioma. She did have a long history of DI. She was kind of all set to, but it, it didn't really come out so well in the history, I guess. And she was all set to, be got, to begin treatment for an optic pathway glioma when the nurse practitioner actually said, you know what, I think there was a history of DI in there. And she dug a little further. Sure enough, the child had had DI for about a year and she ended up having a germ cell tumor, which is a completely different kind of treatment. So it's very important to think of germ cell tumors with DI. Um, they can have other pituitary and hypothalamic abnormalities as well. And just like the craniopharyngiomas, because of the location, you can get visual field defects. Um, they do to secrete varying levels of beta HCG and AFP because as the name suggests, they arise from germ cells, uh, sort of primitive germ cells. Germinomas are among the most, are probably the most common subtype. And these tend to have very low levels of beta HCG uh, in the CSF um, and normal beta HCG levels in the serum. So you have to check serum and CSF. And interestingly, as you see, it says lumbar CSF. So you cannot check CSF from the ventricles. It has to be done by an LP. And the reason is that um, probably it gets sort of diluted out in the ventricles and the levels that you get are not validated and cannot be relied upon. The more um, malignant germ cell tumors, including mixed malignant or secreting germ cell tumors, are the non-germinomatous germ cell tumors, embryonal carcinomas, yolk sac tumors, and choriocarcinomas. And these tend to secrete much higher levels of AFP and beta HCG. So, Here's a little graph just showing that the pattern of beta HCG and AFP in the serum and CSF can help you make the diagnosis. And if the, this pattern is, is very classic, you actually don't need a biopsy or any other tissue um, to make the, the specific diagnosis. So like I said before, um, about up to 13% of Germ cell tumors can be bifocal at the time of diagnosis. So you can see in this patient, here's the supercellular component, and here's the pineal component. You can see this is the post-contrast imaging. And this particular patient, the pineal component was much more prominent and is what brought them to medical attention, but there is the supercellular component as well. So if you ever see a pineal tumor, you have to check the supercellular region and vice versa to make sure that you're not missing something. And this is important because radiation is part of the treatment for germ cell tumors, which we'll get to. And it's given to the locations where the tumor is. So you have to know what areas are affected. So just to compare and contrast um, the typical presentations Craniopharyngiomas are more likely to present with headaches, although germinomas can as well. Germinomas, like I said, DI, DI, DI. Um, growth arrest is the more common pituitary hypothalamic function affected by craniopharyngiomas. You can get vision loss and visual field defects in either of them, but in craniopharyngioma, it tends to be more like monocular visual loss, whereas germinomas, it's more often visual field defects and possibly just because of the how, how slowly the versus how quickly they grow. Um, the, we said, talked about the sex predisposition in germinomas and the age is overlapping, but craniovindioma has, has a much wider age of presentation. <clears throat> However, the more malignant, so mixed malignant germ cell tumors, we tend to see in younger kids. So when you see a supercellular tumor, what is the workup? How, what's the pathway that we go down? So of course, MRI. Um, I, I've heard it said that an MRI is worth a thousand neurologists, which is not true, of course, but an MRI is critical to what we do. Always do an MRI with contrast if you're, if you're suspecting a mass. Uh, cystic versus solid. So the, the, well, we'll talk about this, what differentiates the two in a minute. We, uh, the MRI can also tell us where the tumor originates. Is it unifocal or multifocal? CT is not typically part of the workup, but if a CT was done, which it often is if a child comes through the ER first, we look for calcifications. Endocrine labs are always part of the workup of a supercellular tumor, both to help with the diagnosis and also to know what you're dealing with and what needs treatment down the road. And as I said before, 
serum and lumbar CSF for AFP and beta HCG. <clears throat> so um, comparing the results in these two kinds of tumors, craniopharyngiomas tend to be have that cystic and solid component, whereas germinomas are solid. Craniopharyngiomas only occur in the cellar, supracellar region where germinomas can be bifocal, like we said. Calcifications you see in cranios, but not in germinomas. And um, we talked about the more characteristic growth hormone abnormalities. And AFP and beta HCG are negative in craniopharyngiomas, and they could be different patterns of positivity in um, germinomas. If you're, you think a, a child has a germ cell tumor, the workup must also include an MRI spine because these tumors can metastasize, unlike typically craniopharyngiomas. So you can have um, sites of tumor in the spine as well. And like I said before, if the markers are positive, you don't need a biopsy that itself can make the diagnosis. Now, just so that we don't forget about optic cathode gliomas, they can occur in the supracellar region, as I said before. This is a less common presentation of optic pathway tumors, but it can happen. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and this, here's a coronal view. Here's a sagittal T1 with contrast. And as you see, the tumor is really filling the supracellar region here, right? So on these images, it can be hard to tell, like, is this um, an optic pathway glioma? Is this a germinoma? It can be it can be ambiguous, which is why that patient I mentioned before almost went down the pathway of the wrong tumor type. But on the, the axial cuts, if you look really carefully, you can see that this tumor is arising from the optic nerve here, okay? And then the, it just sort of expanded into the supracellular region. But we have had times where, um, well, backing up a second, optic pathway gliomas also, we often do not biopsy because they have such a characteristic appearance. We can often make the diagnosis without a biopsy. But there are times where we'll see a tumor that looks something like this, and we're just not sure. Tumor markers are negative. Um, and because the treatment pathways are very different, we sometimes do have to biopsy to figure out what exactly it is. Questions so far? All right, so treatment approaches. In general, there are a few important things to keep in mind when deciding how to treat these tumors. Number one, it's these tumors just by definition are very close to critical structures. We talked about the pituitary, the hypothalamus, the optic chiasm. Remember also in that area, you have very important blood vessels, right? Your carotids aren't too far off, um, methyl's cave. So there are a lot of important structures there that could potentially be affected by any treatment that you choose. When we're looking at how to treat these tumors, as opposed to sometimes in adult neuro-oncology and pediatric neuro-oncology, the hope is that if our patients survive these tumors, they have decades of life ahead of them. So you really have to balance the morbidity and mortality. You want to save their lives from the tumors, but you don't want to condemn them to, to severe side effects that will last them lifelong. And that includes cognitive side effects, the metabolic side effects of affecting the pituitary hypothalamic axis, vision, um, I'm sorry, endocrine is a pituitary hypothalamic axis and metabolic as well because of the hypothalamus and its regulation of appetite and satiety. So there's usually some balance of surgical resection, chemotherapy, and radiation that comes into play. For craniopharyngiomas, if you can get the entire thing out, what's called a gross total resection, that's ideal. In fact, if the entire tumor is removed at the time of diagnosis, the five-year progression-free survival is 75 to 80%, which is fantastic. Um, however, just because of the extension of the tumor, sometimes it's not safe to try to get the whole thing out. With a subtotal resection, so leaving some tumor behind, which is a calculated risk that surgeons often take, the um, five-year progression-free survival falls to less than 50%, 40 to 45%. If there's tumor left behind. So if for logistical or anatomical reasons, you can't get a gross total resection, adding post-op radiation therapy brings that five-year survival, um, uh, five-year progression-free survival, so not overall survival, that progression-free survival back up to 70 to 75%. Um, <clears throat> alternatively, you can so, you know, if you don't give radiation up front, but just watch for recurrence or even with radiation, if you continue to observe and the tumor recurs, 
There are chemotherapy and radiation options that can be given afterwards, including gamma knife. So if there's a tiny air, area of recurrence, gamma knife can be a better way to go. And pegylated interferon is used as chemotherapy. There are other chemotherapy regimens that have been trialed in craniopharyngioma with varying success rates. And there, um, and now there are also several chemotherapies that are being tried. And like I said before, there's always a trade-off between morbidity and mortality. So with surgery, of course, there's a risk of damaging critical structures. Radiation comes with side effects as well. Because of the blood vessels that run through the area, patients can have moya moya, they can have stroke, they can wind up with vision loss because of radiation damage to the optic chiasm and the optic nerves, endocrinopathies, and also secondary tumors. Any area of brain that's been exposed to radiation is at higher risk of secondary tumors, including meningiomas and gliomas. When it comes to germ cell tumor, as I said before, these tumors can metastasize. There's significant risk of CNS spread, which is why you have to look at the spine and the spinal cord at the time of diagnosis. Pure germ germinomas are, um, I know this sounds weird, but they're one of my favorite tumors because they are wonderful to treat and they have great response. They're extremely sensitive to radiation. With radiation alone, there's a 90% five-year progression-free survival with germinomas and they just sort of, they really just melt away and respond really well. However, over time, we have found that pre-treating with chemotherapy can actually shrink down the tumors and um, decrease the amount of brain that has to be exposed to radiation afterwards. So standard of care at this point is chemotherapy at the time of, of diagnosis and then radiation afterwards to the area where the tumor was. Like I said before, there is no role for surgery if the diagnosis is clear. Now, this is actually interesting because I gave a version of this grand rounds to a, um, a different institution that's, uh, you know, sort of a smaller hospital, not in, in necessarily a major um, metropolitan center. And they told me that they biopsy all of their germinomas, which I was very surprised at. But it highlights the importance of, of being in a center that has a relatively high volume, especially when it comes to rare tumor type because there's just accumulated experience and knowledge over time. Um, when it comes to non-germinomatous germ cell tumors, the five-year overall survival is far lower. It's only 70%, but it varies significantly by tumor type. Most of these tumors need chemotherapy beforehand and then much more um, comprehensive radiation to include more areas of the brain because of the risk of spread. When it comes to mature teratomas, the surgery is actually the only treatment. That's a, a very different subset, subset, and those tumors are not chemosensitive or radiation sub, um, sensitive. So it's primarily surgery upfront to get out as much as you can. So let's talk about the long-term effects of the tumors and the treatment. Because like I said before, our perspective in treating children with brain tumors, especially supracellar tumors, is that these kids have decades ahead of them. So what do we need to look out for? And particularly as a neurologist and a pediatric neurologist, what are the kinds of things that we're treating? So in terms of outcomes, craniopharyngiomas, the five-year overall survival is 83 to 96%. So the vast majority of these kids do survive. For germ cell tumors, it varies by type, but for germinomas, it's over 90%. Um, and then mixed germinomas are next, and teratomas, embryonal tumors, and carcinomas have a much lower overall survival. Um, so you're, you know, we're sort of less worried about the long-term side effects and more worried about, about survival at the time of diagnosis. With craniopharyngiomas, the morbidity of the tumor and the treatment are quite significant, and that includes cognitive loss, obesity from affecting the hypothalamic pathways, as, um, as I mentioned, and we'll talk about more, and then endocrinologic abnormalities, panhypopituitarism, or any variation, any of the, the pituitary um, pathways can be involved. The craniopharyngiomas, um, survivors tend to have a poor quality of life with more aggressive resection. So we said before that if you get the whole thing out, you can bring up the survival, but you really risk damaging adjacent um, structures and impacting quality of life moving forward. With germ cell tumors, the morbidity of the radiation treatment depends on the dose and the volume which is why, as I said before, with germinomas, we try to shrink down the tumor before giving radiation so we can minimize how much radiation is needed. 
the chemotherapy for germ cell tumors can result in hearing loss and infertility. So for, for boys, we, if they're old enough, we try to bank sperm beforehand because they may actually um, have infertility afterwards. And then they can get secondary malignant tumors because of the radiation. I actually just saw a, um, a patient yesterday who was one of my first patients in fellowship. He was diagnosed with a pure germinoma and he came for follow-up yesterday with his wife and his one-year-old baby, which was great to see. Um, but these are things that we need to keep in mind. Generally, germ cell tumors, there's a lower long-term, there's a less of a risk of long-term morbidity, but these are things to keep in mind. So panhypopituitarism, many patients with supracellar and intracellular tumors wind up with panhypopit. Sometimes it's from the tumor itself and they actually present with panhypopit at the time of diagnosis. Um, but we also risk throwing them into panhypopituitarism because of our treatments. As we said, so DI is a, a diabetes insipidus is a major presenting feature of germ cell tumors, both, but post-operative up to 90% of craniopharyngioma patients have DI as well. So often from the damaging the stalk, um, we give these patients DI. These patients can swing between hypo and hypernatremia, and some of these kids lose their thirst mechanism. So they don't know, you know, basically our body regulates our sodium levels by the thirst mechanism. So if your sodium level is rising, you feel thirsty, you drink, and it brings it back down. But if these kids don't have a thirst mechanism, they can swing, have really dramatic swings between sodium being quite high and quite low, um, which can trigger seizures, coma, and even death. So some of these children, especially in the immediate post-op period, have to measure everything they drink and all the urine that they produce, which you can imagine how difficult that is in a young child. Um, many of these kids, if they have panhypopit, as they get older, they need growth hormone replacement, sex hormone replacement, thyroid hormone replacement, and stress hormone replacement. So they're often on very complicated medication regimens. They need stress dosing of cortisol if they're gonna have any kind of procedure, and that includes MRIs with contrast or LPs. Um, if they're sick, they can very easily go into crisis because of their cortisol levels don't keep up if they're not stress dosed. It can be quite difficult to fine tune. So I think you know, panhypopituitarism is probably one of the most difficult things um, for survivors of pituitary or supracellular tumors to deal with. Another issue that doesn't, I think, get enough attention is hypothalamic obesity, which I've hinted at a few times already. So more than 50% of craniopharyngioma survivors develop hypothalamic obesity. This is the growth chart of one of my patients who had a craniopharyngioma, and we'll, we'll actually talk more about him very soon. This is his weight, this is his age, and this is when his tumor was diagnosed. This is less than, you can't see it so clearly, but this is like six months later. So you can see how he just shot right up the growth curve. And we don't understand exactly why it happens. The thought is that it's multifactorial. So one is the, um, the hypothalamus helps regulate your leptin and ghrelin balance, and that is affected after these uh, in craniopharyngioma patients. They often are also um, have to cut down on their activity levels, at least in the immediate post-op period. You know, so if they were very active in sports, there's often a few months where they can't really participate. Um, often they have increased daytime sleepiness, and that's probably also just because of the location. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they just don't feel energetic. And then some of it's behavioral. You know, many kids with critical illness, the parents sort of, uh, you know, get used to giving them whatever they want. And, and for lack of a better term, they can, they can wind up being maybe more spoiled or indulged just because they went through such a traumatic experience. Food is often used as a reward, you know, sit still for this blood draw and we'll go out for ice cream afterwards. So it's, there's a complex, and I'm not trying to blame parents for this, not at all, but it's just one more factor that results in very dramatic obesity in these um, tumor survivors. And that can affect mood, it can affect social interaction, it can affect self-esteem, and it also winds up in this downward spiral where, you know, because they, they are gaining weight very, very dramatically, that leads to being even less physically active, less going out with friends, less participation in sports and social activities. 
There are also radiation effects to keep in mind. So effects on the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the radiation itself, like I said before, can damage vision. Um, we talked about the secondary radiation induced tumors, which can be benign or malignant. Um, you can have brain fog or cognitive decline, both in the short term and the long term with radiation. And then radiation induced vasculopathy, including moya moya, strokes and cavernomas. So little bleeding clusters of blood vessels. There, now we're using protons more than photons for radiation, gamma knife at the time of recurrence. We still are working on the long-term data, but the hope is that these more targeted radiation approaches can improve outcomes. So what's the role of a child neurologist? There are lots of, lots of the things that I mentioned that a child neurologist can help manage. So the altered sleep-wake cycle, we can manage with medication. Um, Off-label modafinil or stimulants can be used for this and can be quite helpful. As, and for this, the uh, decreased alertness that you can see, the hormonal balance and the panhypo pit is usually managed by the endocrinologist, but we often work very closely with them. Um, they often see us more often than the endocrinologist, so we have to plug them in if we see there's a problem. Helping with vision. Treatment options for obesity are, are still, you know, we're still learning. Metformin um, shows promise for some kids. Uh, there's one child we just actually started on Vyvanse, not for ADHD, but for, you know, we, we sort of got it covered under binge eating disorder, but really for, to help with weight loss. And so far I saw him on Wednesday, he lost four pounds in four weeks, which is great because he had also been on this really dangerous upward trajectory. Um, some of these kids have seizures. It can be secondary to surgery or for longstanding increased ICP. Sometimes by the time they're diagnosed like that child with a crane with them, um, the child who had that very widened cell odd, they might have been living with increased ICP for quite a long time. Okay, so we're going to talk about two uh, craniopharyngioma examples to bring it all together. And again, these are real patients. So this patient was a six-year-old boy who had decreased linear growth. And then, by the way, we're going to come back to our original, our original um, cases. I haven't forgotten them. So he was healthy, super active. I think he played soccer. Um, and baseball, he had excellent grades. He had a workup for his decreased growth velocity and was found to have low growth hormone. He had a CT, I don't know why they did a CT first, um, poor choice on the part of the endocrinologist, but that's what happened. He had a CT and an MRI. And as you can see here, these are those calcifications that I said are classic for craniopharyngioma. And you can see this sort of cystic and solid multi-cystic mass in the supracellar region. His pituitary actually doesn't look too bad, but the stalk is definitely affected here. Um, the family were from out of state, so they originally saw local physicians and were told to pursue a partial resection and then adjuvant radiation therapy because of the location. The, th the surgeons did not think that they could safely get the whole thing out. Remember that drops down your overall survival or your progression-free survival rate. So they came for a consultation at NYU and our surgeons, Dr. Jeff Wissoff, felt that he was able to safely get a gross total resection and hopefully avoid radiation. Um, this is his post-surgical MRI, which you see, I mean, this is pretty amazing. The whole tumor is gone. He did really well after surgery. He did have a right Horner syndrome and he had some daytime sleepiness. That was very unusual for him because he was usually this energetic kind of rah, 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 six-year-old. Eight months later, we saw him in the clinic. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, his Horner syndrome had resolved. His vision was normal, which is pretty miraculous. I mean, looking forward for a second, you know, he, I think he got lucky. It sort of just missed the chiasm. So his vision was normal, which was great. His MRI was stable. The tumor wasn't back, all good news. But that growth chart that I showed you before, this, that was his growth chart. So eight, within eight months, he had gone from being very tiny to being well above, um, you know, above the 95th percentile. And now his parents said he's eating a good diet. They're being really careful. They're giving health, him healthy snacking choices, but he was not in, in soccer or baseball anymore. Partially he had to pull out after the surgery and then he just didn't have the energy to get back into it once his, he had recovered from surgery. Um, his alertness was slowly getting better since the surgery, but he was struggling to stay awake in his classes. He had had excellent grades before, and now he was really starting to drop and struggle. Um, we advocated, we and the family advocated getting a neuropsych evaluation and implementing an IEP to help him during the day. 
Um, and we talked about starting Vyvanse with dexamphetamine for appetite control. Unfortunately, I don't have follow up past that eight months. So TBD, we'll see how he, how he does. Another craniopharyngioma number two. So this is a child who was diagnosed in China in 1999. Unclear to me what symptoms he initially presented with. I think it was a signs of elevated intracranial pressure, but I'm not sure. Um, this is his CT. So it's always fun when, when people come with films and you have to either try to find the light box or a, a nice big window to hold it up against. Um, and you can see the calcif the tumor here, right? You can see the calcifications and the cystic and solid component of it. He underwent a craniotomy, a partial resection. They got out whatever they safely could. And then he had radiation afterwards. <clears throat> he arrived in the United States in 2006. He also had a CT from 2002 from China. And you can see that there's a little bit of something left, but much smaller than it had been before. Not entirely clear why he had the CT in 2002. He didn't have any um, treatment at that time, but you could see that those residual, that residual calcification, which is the tumor left behind. Now, fast forward to 2010, he was living in the United States, but had not had um, ongoing medical care. But in 2010, he presented with one week of vision loss in his left eye, right-sided weakness, and a left cranial nerve three palsy. In the ER, he was found to have a sodium of 124, and he had a seizure actually in the ER on his way to MRI. He had a CT. Uh, oh, shoot, I don't know why, I, I apologize. That slide is not, huh. Oh, there it is, okay. He had a CT, I don't know why I jumped ahead. But you see that here is that residual calcification from 2002, and clearly the tumor is back, this large component here, right? And you can see this multi-cystic lesion here. Um, let's see it here too. And he had another surgical resection. Again, they were unable to get the whole thing out, so it's a partial resection. He was treated with vimblastin, which is not really routine for craniopharyngiomas, but at the time, I, I think he was on a clinical trial. He never recovered vision in his left eye, but he stabilized. Now, fast forward again to 2016. He is now, um, at the time of 2016, blind in the left eye. He has a temporal hemianopsia in the right eye. So he has really not very much vision. He has just kind of a thin sliver in his right eye. He has cognitive loss or cognitive um, disabilities and is in special education. He had panhypopituitarism, but it was being well managed and was stable. He had hypothalamic obesity, very poor social skills, low energy, um, had difficulty. You know, we tried to get him into extracurricular activities, help him engage with other kids, and he just really had very poor energy and engagement. He had been seizure free since that time in 2010 and was weaned off of his AEDs. Now that his sodium and panhypopit was stable, he did not have any more seizures. And at this time, this was his imaging, so he still had significant residual tumor and was started on monthly peg interferon. Now, fast forward to 2022, he's actually still on monthly pegylated interferon, which is a chemotherapy for craniopharyngiomas. Um, his vision loss is stable. His tumor has been stable since 2016. Still is obese, but he's trying to get more exercise and trying to be more, more active. So clearly, you know, there are a lot of gaps in treatment for craniopharyngioma and a lot of room for improvement. So number one, can safer radical resections be improved? If we get the entire tumor out and spare kids from the effects of radiation, we can, might be able to help with long-term symptoms. So how can we get out as much as the tumor without damaging ad adjacent structures? And that's, like I said before, that's where um, being in a center where they see a lot of these tumors is really important. You know, there are some, some surgeries and procedures where you can get anywhere, but when you're talking, with a rare, talking about a rare entity, the more um, of these surgeries a center does, the better, the more likely you are to have a good surgical outcome. And there's a huge need for targeted therapies in craniopharyngiomas. It's really a gap there. Um, in, in low-grade gliomas and other tumors of childhood, we're very much moving towards non-surgical treatment options and targeted therapy. So not just bazooka gun, shoot everything down chemotherapy, 
but, but chemotherapy that targets specific pathways, specific enzymes, and has a much better side effect profile while still being efficacious in, in treating the tumors. Um, if we have a good targeted therapy, could we treat pre-surgically to reduce the size of the tumor and then get a safer or more, more um, likely to get a gross total reception? Like I said before, the papillary subtype, which is more common in older children, often has a BRAF B600E mutation. Um, some people are trying to use MEK inhibitors, which is another way, place in that pathway, and I don't have a diagram up, I'm, I'm gonna spare you, but could that be a direction to go for treating these tumors? When it comes to germ cell tumor, we've come very, very far in the treatment of germ cell tumors since we used to just give radiation. Um, like I said, when we were talking about germ cell tumors, we give chemotherapy upfront to shrink down the tumor, and that's limit, really limited or almost eliminated the role of surgery and the, even the role of biopsies. Um, more effective chemotherapy may be helpful in even further reducing radiation. There have been clinical trials that tried chemotherapy only. And as I'll show you soon, when you give chemotherapy to germ cell tumors, they just melt away. At the end of chemotherapy, you can't even see them, often can't even see them anymore. However, trying to get away with only chemotherapy resulted in very high recurrence rates. Whereas chemotherapy plus, plus radiation in germ cell tumor, there's over a 90% progression-free survival at five years. So that was not successful. So as of now, we still need chemotherapy plus radiation I'm always looking for more effective regimens. Like I said before, proton radiation, gamma knife, maybe we can reduce the amount of radiation we're exposing these children to and thereby decreasing the long-term morbidity. So I'm gonna go back to our original cases, unless, are there any questions before I do that? Okay, so I, I don't know if you remember our original um, cases, but I'll, I'll give the brief overview and then I'd love if people could chime in either unmute or just put in the chat what they think it is. So just as a reminder, case one was the four-year-old with a very uh, precocious and intelligent eight-year-old brother. He had celiac, the growth deceleration, no vision in his left eye. As a reminder, this was his MRI with that very enlarged cella. What do we think it is? Anybody, anybody? Here was his CT, this should give it away. No MRI is seen. I can't see an MRI. Oh, you guys can't see it? I think there was something else. Um, Murray says it's a craniopharyngioma and it looks pretty typical to me as well. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. So this is clearly, this is that calcification, the uh, classic sign for a craniopharyngioma. And they're stuck. So yes, it was a craniopharyngioma. He had a gross total resection. Um, they were able to get the entire tumor out, which is great. Postoperatively, he also had a Horner syndrome um, and he had some intermittent decreased vision on the right. He now has panhypopituitarism. He presented with growth hormone deficiency, um, but now after surgery has panhypopit. His thirst mechanism recovered, thankfully, which makes it much easier to manage sodium levels. And he's on a stable, complete hormone replacement regimen and doing very well. Um, the vision in his right eye slowly improved from probably there was just some post-op edema and his weight remained stable. So he actually never developed obesity and that might be in part because of the, the more anterior location of the tumor. Um, so just to, sorry remind you very quickly, you see how anterior it is. So perhaps it was less hypothalamic involvement. Um, also remember he had been diagnosed with celiac disease the year before. So his family and he were much, were very used to behavioral control of what he was eating already. Um, by about six months after the surgery, his energy level was back, his behavioral level was back, his personality was back. Um, I get to see some follow-up of him because he, his uh, aunt lives across the street from me still. So I see him sometimes on holidays or family events. He's doing great in school. He's participating in sports and really had a, a phenomenal <laughs> outcome. Darling. <laughs> um, now this was his MRI six months post-op. So you see there's absolutely no tumor recurrence, which is wonderful. And he continues to be recurrence-free. 
Now, case two, this was the 18-year-old boy who had a history of, of complex partial seizures. He was the one who was, <clears throat> excuse me, drinking a gallon of water every night, um, was found to, found to have hypotension and hypothyroidism. This was his MRI brain. And this is the post contrast for him. So what do we think this one is? Like 50-50, guys. Do you think it's a craniopharyngioma? Germinoma. Yeah, there you go. Someone was paying attention. Very good. Mm -hmm. It is a germinoma. Now, looking back, there was this questionable area, and you can't actually see it so well in this MRI, but there was a questionable area of enhancement at the pineal region as well. So he was diagnosed with a germ cell tumor. His serum, AFP, and beta HCG were normal. So this was a pure germinoma. Um, he got, and his his, I'm sorry, his serum AFP and HCG were normal. His CSF beta HCG was very slightly elevated. So again, this is a pure germinoma, which is great. He did not need a biopsy because we were able to make the diagnosis based on the tumor markers. He was treated with four cycles of chemotherapy and his tumor completely disappeared after the chemotherapy. He then received proton radiation to the whole ventricles and the cella. And he also got a boost to the pineal region because as I said, there was this questionable area of a second, questionable area of enhancement. And we were concerned that he had a secondary lesion at the pituitary. Um, his MRI remained negative long-term and tumor markers remain negative as well. He did develop, he, well, he had panhypopit at the time of diagnosis, as it turned out, and he struggled to really get a, on a good regimen and had to go through, cycle through a few endocrinologists before he found someone um, who really got him on a stable regimen and kept him safe. He ended up getting a scholarship to college, so he wrote his, at his uh, personal statement and his essay about his experience with the brain tumor. Um, and he has now graduated. He's moved to a different state. He started his own business, remains tumor-free, and is doing fantastic. This is his MRI post-chemotherapy. So this is even before radiation. I remember he never had um, he never had surgery, and the tumor is completely gone. But as you can see, his pituitary, which probably at the time of diagnosis had been compressed by this tumor for months. I mean, you can see the stalk, but you barely see that little flat pancake of a pituitary, which you know explains why he had pen pit. But um, I saw him a couple of months ago when he, he comes back still once a year to, for his follow-up, but he, like I said, he owns his own business. He's an independent functional adult and doing really well. These are my references. And I'd like to thank, of course, the patients and their families, the, my colleagues with whom I shared the care of these patients, Jeffrey Allen, Sharon Gardner, Matias Karianis, and Jeffrey Wissoff. And thank you all for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Siegel, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can put it in the chat or in mute. Um, I guess one of my questions is, because a lot of these supercellular tumors, like <clears throat> a lot of them don't necessarily have the typical brain tumor symptoms. Um, do a lot of them come to you from endocrinologists or where do a lot of the referrals come from? Yeah, that's a real, uh, a really good question. And, and just a total side note, when you say brain tumor symptoms, you know, I think as I, I did general neurology for a long time, um, before really coming back to my roots and specializing in, in neuro oncology. And everyone thinks when everyone thinks brain tumor equals headaches, right? Every child I see with headaches, the parents deep down inside, they might not admit it to you, they might not even admit it to themselves, but their deepest fear is that their child has a brain tumor. Actually, headaches are not really, it is a presentation of brain tumors, but other presentations are more common. Um, anecdotally, I have had a number of kids diagnosed with brain tumors because they keep coming to the ER with vomiting nausea and vomiting and are sent home five times being told it's, it's a viral GI, you know, it's, it's gastroenteritis, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Until so someone says, wait, this is lasting weeks. Maybe we should get an MRI. And sure enough, there's a, a, a brain tumor with um, either increased ICP or sometimes the area post rema is affected. Um, so, you know, so when you say typical brain tumor symptoms, people think headache, but there are actually other things as well. So many of these patients come actually from ophthalmology because they are, they're found to have vision loss or from endocrinology, or they come to the ER in crisis, um, like the kid who had complete vision loss or the kid who had a sodium of 124, and then they're someone thinks, oh wait, this might be 
this might need imaging, this might be structural and sends them to us. Um, I actually had another kid just not long ago, he just had his three month follow-up scan who um, his mother, he's, uh, how old is he? he's 12. And his mother took him for an eye exam just because she felt like, hey, everyone should see an ophthalmologist. And again, and like that four-year-old, he has no vision in one eye and he never noticed it. And his tumor is probably, he had a biopsy. It's an optic pathway glioma that's just sitting in the cella. Uh, but we have no idea how long this has been going on for. So yeah, interesting that they have different presentations. Um, people don't, a DI can go unrecognized for a very long time. So that other kid who I mentioned had, um, who we thought was a, a optic pathway is actually a germinoma, had a year of DI, was actually seeing an endocrinologist for growth failure. Um, but never really thought to mention the DI and wasn't asked about it explicitly. And then she ended up having an MRI for because she failed a growth hormone stim test and came to us. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, something that like our attendings always remind us is that we always have to have a high index of suspicion. Um, even like a few months ago, we found a patient that had a... Um, I think it was a pilocytic astrocytoma, but her only symptoms was neck pain. And his only symptom on examination was that he couldn't hop as well on one side. Wow. Um, so he didn't have any anything else. So you just really have to have a high index of suspicion. And suspicion. it was the neck pain actually from the pilocytic yeah. astrocytoma? Really? Was it cerebellar? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, I think that it's a tough balance to strike and, and I will not get on my soapbox today because that's not the topic here, but, <laughs> but um, for, I, you know, as it, when I, back to when I did general child neurology, at least 40% of what I saw was headaches. Um, and one of my pet peeves was people over imaging for headaches. And actually that it's an interesting t statistic. There are um, about 20% of pediatric brain MRIs have an incidental finding, 20%, which is crazy. And then we're stuck following it. You know, you find this little ditzel in the hypothalamus that has nothing to do with the headaches, but now you're stuck doing MRIs until you, until five years when you could say, okay, this is nothing, um, which is not just a, a waste of resources, but causes a lot of stress and anxiety for parents and kids. So one of my pet peeves is over imaging. Um, but now in the brain tumor world, I think sometimes we swing, you know, it's, you can swing the other way and say, oh no, you don't want to miss something. And it's a balance that it can be hard to strike. You know, you want to have a high index of suspicion image when indicated, but not get an MRI in every child who comes with, with neck pain. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes we make mistakes, you know, like mm -hmm. I, I think it's easy to miss things. It's, e it's easy to over image, um, especially when the findings are subtle, not to scare you all. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and then there's one uh, question in the chat from Dr. Ansiska. He asks, um, do any of these tumors recur in adulthood, especially the germ cell tumors? That's a really good question. Um, so usually with germ cell tumors, we say once you're past five years, you're kind of in the clear. You know, these are more malignant tumors. So if they don't recur within five years, they're probably not going to recur. The pure germinomas, the recurrence rate is, is vanishingly low. Um, the more the mixed malignant, mixed malignant germ cell tumors and brinal cell tumors, they can recur, but it's usually within three years. So when you say in adulthood, it's they're usually still kids if they recur. Um, the craniopharyngiomas, there was an article I saw recently about craniopharyngiomas in adults. I honestly just read the abstract. I didn't read the whole paper. Um, so it can occur in adults and it's it can you can sometimes still be dealing with it in, into adulthood. Like that child from China, he's now 24 and he's still receiving treatment from his craniopharyngioma, but he was diagnosed in childhood. It's pretty rare to be diagnosed with a craniopharyngioma in adulthood. Um, germ cell tumors can occur primarily in adults. I have a few young adult patients, but that's their first diagnosis. I, I can't think of anyone who is diagnosed in childhood and, and then truly recurred in adulthood. Does that make sense? I think so. Other questions? Uh, yeah, one other comment. Uh, from my review of literature, old literature, the cranio had, uh, uh, you know, bimodal presentation. There was also a group that presented in older adults. Has that been your experience? So that, I think that was that abstract that I just saw is published in uh, neuro-oncology last month. 
I only take care of kids. So I don't really, I have very little experience with craniopharyngiomas in adults, but I have seen that in the literature. I mean, I take care of kids and young adults, but I don't really take care of older adults. So I can't speak from experience, but yes, that has been reported. Other questions? Anyone else? All right. Great, thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel. It was nice seeing you. Same here, great seeing you. Good luck to everyone. everyone. <laughs> Bye.